Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, thank you, Fabrice. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, but today, the title is, uh, of the talk is SAR mode altimetry observations of internal solitary waves in the tropical ocean. Now, let me start by saying that these internal waves are not internal tidal waves, but are short period internal waves, uh, usually termed solitons in the literature, and uh, that some people like to, 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 to name them internal solitary waves. Um, my co-authors on this is my student, Adriana, and uh, Merrick Schrockos from the uh, National Oceanography Center. Um, so I will uh, briefly introduce you to the um, uh, phenomena. Um, the why, why should we care about uh, internal solitons? Uh, SAR imaging at uh, oblique angles and nadir looking altimeters. And um, um, I will show you uh, case studies, so evidence that internal solitary waves are nicely captured in SAR altimetry with Sentinel-3. Um, then um, I will describe a mean square slope method uh, to deal with these observations and also uh, discuss some uh, sea level anomaly uh, produced by the internal solitons and uh, show you st statistics for the tropical Atlantic and come to some conclusions and uh, uh, prospects of future work. So the, the aim of this study so far has been to uh, produce an algorithm for automatic detection of internal solitary waves in uh, high rate SAR mode altimetry of these uh, nonlinear large amplitude internal waves. And uh, what you're seeing right now is a map um, with the world distribution of solitons in the ocean produced using uh, about two years of data from uh, MODIS. Um, the case studies that we're going to see uh, this afternoon are from uh, the uh, tropical Atlantic uh, um, off the Amazon River and also uh, from the uh, Andaman Sea, a place in the tropical oceans where there are uh, very large uh, nonlinear internal waves that can reach easily 100 meters uh, in amplitude. Motivations to study these internal waves? Well, um, I could be speaking for uh, many tens of minutes about those, but uh, essentially, um, one of the reasons is that, uh, for instance, some people believe that they have a role in producing um, algae blooms or even uh, harmful algae blooms because they resuspend sediments from the bottom and these can uh, sort of awake some, some seeds, some kists that are uh, waiting uh, to, to, to produce the blooms. Of course, also some implications for erosion and vertical fluxes. Uh, these internal waves, they have strong uh, horizontal and vertical velocities. And these vertical velocities perdure for uh, tens of minutes. And it has been shown that vertical fluxes in internal solitary waves can be as much as and probably higher, 1,000 times more than in the ambient uh, shelf. So this is important, and people have realized that. And there's a lot of people, in, especially in the United States, who care about internal waves. Um, well, most people here know about how to identify and interpret uh, signatures in SAR of internal solitons. They are typically, sorry, they are typically um, produced by bright and dark bands in succession and they, they sort of delineate the direction of propagation, so you can interpret them. And they are produced essentially by uh, roughness. So this roughness uh, is a result of horizontal gradients, convergences and divergences at the sea surface of capillary gravity waves. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I had a conversation uh, with Alexis Mouche and uh, he pointed out that this could be interesting to look at uh, the new, with new altimeters to look at internal waves. 
And two years later, here I am talking about it. So thank you, Alexis. I, I'm not sure if he's right here now. Um, here's the typical radiogram from JSON 2. So this is an ordinary post-limited altimeter, uh, V-shaped um, signatures that are uh, consistent with the uh, uh, roughness patterns of solitons. They have a signature in sigma naught, uh, off nadir angle, which is a measure of the waveform, and significant wave height. Now, how, how, how calibrated these are, of course, we don't know, but uh, the, the signatures are there. The problem with, um, with this is that we need to do synergy to validate the observations, and synergy is only possible nowadays with Sentinel-3. Uh, our method uh, to look at internal waves with an altimeter consists of uh, uh, calculate the mean square slope, um, which is defined such as this equation here, based on the slope spectrum um, at the given wave number. Uh, and for altimeters, we basically uh, use a Kirchhoff method, so-called geometric optics, uh, to uh, describe the, the, the signatures. Here's how it's formulated. And for an ID looking uh, altimeter, you have uh, simply that the mean square slope is inversional proportional to sigma naught with a Fresnel coefficient that is somehow adapted for the effect. Now, um, so for a, for a SAR looking sideways, you see internal salt and usually as a bright and uh, uh, succeeded by a dark band. But for an altimeter, what you should expect to see then is a dark or a reduced backscatter followed by an enhanced backscatter signature. And that's uh, what we really observe. Now, the new SARAL or, or SAR mode altimeter on Sentinel 3 has a much finer uh, uh, resolution along track, uh, about 300 meters which is within the uh, capabilities of large internal solitons or internal solitary wave manifestations at the surface, which can be as large as one, two or th more kilometers, up to 10 kilometers, uh, as compared to the uh, conventional altimetry, which will, be, will have a radius much bigger that somehow it also is sensitive to, um, uh, to the internal solitons, but it, uh, um, it's much, uh, it, it combines uh, uh, mixed contributions. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's sensitive, but it's not, it's not uh, as uh, sensitive uh, as we expect the, the SAR mode to be. And here is uh, what uh, we see, the difference between, uh, this is in the Andaman Sea. Um, that's a Sar uh, uh, Sentinel-3 track. That's a JSON. Uh, three track, and that's a JSON three uh, long track sigma naught in KU band, the same for the SAR mode. And you see that with the SAR mode, we nicely capture the internal solitons, while here they, are, they produce a signature, but uh, it's obviously not as uh, detailed. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> And um, <laughs> so um, this is an example of uh, an internal soliton in the off, off the Amazon in deep water, with two two solitons that you see here. That's the satellite, the the altimeter track, and it produces, as you can see, uh, a, a signature in the radiogram of in the SAR mode. There's a signature in KU and C band. Uh, this, there's also a signature in significant wave height, and look, there's a signature, positive uh, departure from the mean level in sea level anomaly, and this is actually what is expected from theory. But we don't know uh, if this is just by, by, by chance or if it's, uh, it's a, a real measure, uh, as I will hope to have time to discuss later. Because if we have a soliton, then there is supposed to be an elevation of the sea surface if the soliton is of depression. And this elevation is of the order of 10, 20, 40 centimeters. And that's exactly what we, we are uh, measuring here. Now, if it's true or not, we will see. And, but of course, what we can say is that there is definitely a measure that is true in the backscatter, which is nicely captured here by the waveforms. Another example 
from another date, also uh, off the Amazon River. The, this is a Sentinel-3 uh, Olchi image in uh, RGB uh, form. And there's uh, these um, gray bands here correspond to solitons. The solitons in this region can be very large, can re easily reach 100 meters uh, amplitude. And this is a satellite track processed in color for sea level anomaly, depicting even at one hertz, depicting the, uh, the solitons. And there's the, the waveforms uh, in 20 hertz uh, um, pr uh, coming in KU band from, from this track. These, these are clouds. No, the, the big one. Here? Oh, this is because it was taken from um, Ocean Data Lab. So it, it had the currents. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Nicely spotted, yes. Okay. It's just an artifact, sorry. Okay, okay. You should put that on the slide. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so here's a radar gram of the same uh, observation. And you see that the crest has reduced backscatter and the trough has en enhanced backscatter, which actually coincides or should coincide with the slick band that uh, mo uh, many people know that are associated uh, with it, these internal waves. And here is the difference between the uh, crest in red and the, the trough in blue, the, the trough in blue with much higher backscatter, all the, the dots in dark uh, represent uh, many observations along track. So all this has been done with level two data so far. Now, the method. The method con consists of, um, uh, well, it's, it's in inspired in a paper by Bertrand. Um, they use the differenced mean square slope um, from KU and C band, uh, which is, has to be tuned by a uh, parameter. Uh, and should be essentially uh, sensitive to wavelengths in the, on the centimeter to decimeter scale because we are separating the larger waves from, from the smaller waves. And this is exactly, exactly the time, uh, the space scales that are associated with most of the convergence and divergence within the internal wave field. Um, here are the PDF for a, um, a region in the South Pacific a void of um, internal waves, so internal solitons. And here is for the Amazon region where we have internal waves. And you can see two things in this region. You can see a higher end MSS mean square slope uh, tail with higher uh, mean square slope and also uh, some at smaller scales compared to this other uh, region that does not have the... Uh, the, um, the internal waves. We use this for our baseline to, to, to do the following criteria. So the red line corresponds to the mean square slope as a function of wind speed for the region void of internal waves in the Pacific. And then there's a, the green, a green line and a blue line that separates plus or minus two meters per second um, correspondence with mean square slope. And we say that all that is above this red, uh, this green line, and all that is below this uh, blue line can be internal solitons, can be this, the roughness manifestations of internal solitons. So our method includes, so I'm not going into detail of the method. The method has, is be under development, is, uh, but it's quite uh, mature now. Um, we include a criteria that uh, needs the sea level anomaly uh, to be higher than six centimeters for, for a measurement to be classified as uh, internal soliton. We use some wavelet analysis algorithm that is independent of this, but uses mean square slope and, and checks for high frequency um, signals. And then we combine all these results and come up with a combined automatic detection criteria which uh, detects the places where the internal solitons are in the data, which are here depicted in uh, red color. And we did this for the Amazon region. I'm going to show you just one, uh, one orbit 
uh, which where, where, where we know that these internal solitons are very frequent. So we looked uh, from uh, cycles 13 to 34, about 22, 22 cycles, and we uh, uh, detected internal solitons in 16 out of 22, so in 73% of the time, which matches our expectations from our knowledge of the study region. And the, these 16, they are validated in five occasions with all G images. So we know that at, um, five, uh, from five OLT images that exactly matched our validation, our, our procedure. But that doesn't mean that it's only have 31% of validation cases because uh, all, because the other cases were all cloud contaminated. So we believe that uh, our validation is close to 100%. But we don't know, of course, because um, in these regions, as you know, it's heavily contaminated by clouds. And um, so the other 69% of the cases are contaminated by cloud. Now, coming towards the end of this talk, now our following um, uh, aim would be, um, is, to um, come up with a method and a theory to retrieve uh, wave amplitudes from the displacement of the, um, uh, or the elevation of, of the sea surface, which is measured by the altimeter. What is also measured by the altimeter or by other remote sensing methods is the wavelengths. So we believe that uh, knowing the elevation, which, has been not, which is not known by any other means of remote sensing, and the scales, the spatial um, scales, we should be able to get uh, a number for the uh, amplitude of the waves. And this is important for industry, for oil industry. I have a friend and a colleague who did the PhD at the time with Craig, uh, Gus Jeans. Uh, he did a career, he's doing a career out of working with the oil industry. And the main concern of these people are the cu currents, horizontal and vertical, and also the wave uh, uh, amplitudes. So th this, this uh, these uh, f figures, they, they need to be known, um, even not uh, for scientists. Of course, for, for science, uh, for oceanographers, they are important, as we, we've discussed. But in order to do that, we need to know what the sea level anomaly, if it's true or not, or how it, is, how it can become true. Because, uh, as you might know, um, the waveforms are converted into sea level anomaly depending on the maxima here of the waveform, the, back, the, back, the sigma naught value. And, um, and the, the, the timing of the altimeter and therefore the sea level anomaly is correlated with sigma naught somehow. So we need, we need to, to study this to come up with a sea level anomaly that is meaningful. Because at the moment, the values seem okay, but it may not be the truth. And once we have done that, we are pretty confident that uh, with uh, theory, with the, our knowledge of the stratification and recurring to um, a nonlinear model such as scott vec de Vries or some other, we should be able to convert currents, sea level anomaly, space scales, into um, surface elevation to get, finally, um, the currents and the wave amplitudes. So the currents in the ocean produced by these phenomena are of the order of two meters per second, and the vertical currents are of the order of 0 0.2 meters per second. This is pretty significant compared to, with my colleague just uh, talked about submesoscale. So these are um, the time scales and also the, uh, the the values, the magnitude of the currents are, are similar to sub scale. So in conclusion, um, we have um, looked at SAR altimeter on board Sentinel-3A and now 3B, and we uh, conclude that uh, Sentinel-3 is sensitive to surface roughness modulations originated by large-scale internal solitary waves in the tropical ocean. The internal wave signatures are apparent in the radar gram, the radar power uh, signal, sigma naught, and in sea level anomaly. 
sometimes even in uh, sea surface height. And uh, an automatic uh, algorithm has been developed to detect internal solitons and validated with um, ocean color images. And there appears to be a signature in the sea surface height anomaly as predicted by internal wave theory. This may enable us to retrieve internal solitary wave amplitudes and vertical currents. And it will be very nice uh, with upcoming missions such, such as SCHEME and uh, SWOT to see uh, all this happening because um, when, uh, when we say that SWOT can, can measure in the coastal zone 250 meters uh, resolution, then, then it features like this with, uh, with sea level anomalies will, will, be ma will be available and then a lot more work and prediction of uh, in wave amplitudes, etc., will be possible to retrieve. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jose. Nice talk. Um, one thing you could do is you could go a little bit further and you could use the Sentinel-3 A and B satellites together in the tandem phase. You yes. can have a dual look. And also, at that same time, you can use the Level 1A product, which gives you access to all the waveforms uh, produced by yes. the 18.5 kilohertz burst. You, you have everything to go much, much further here. Okay. And uh, that way, you can then even use fully focused SAR methods where you tune speckle noise against resolution to go look for those solitons because you know where they are because yeah. you've got the ultra image assuming it's clear. Yeah. So you could do something very nice with the combination there. Yes, thank you, Craig. As we, we looked at some level 1B stacked data, um, it's promising. So please keep, keep providing the level 1 data because it's being used. Thank you. <laughs> One question, say on this automatic detection. Yeah. What if this altimeter passes, uh, not the center of an addy, uh -huh. but on the edges of the addy, you are now having <laughs> scales, both horizontally and vertically, which can become comparable. Yes, that's right. And would you have a way out of it? Or Well, first of all, I, um, I should say that uh, this is working fine for the, the region of study that I, I mentioned. But if you have a, a crest that is uh, nearly coincident in direction with the uh, satellite track, then it's a problem. And it's not nicely detected at all. Also, if the waves are very small, they're not uh, detected. And as Yoni was saying, um, we um, are interested to look at other sub mesoscale features and to see if we find a way to discriminate between um, these other features, these other small features, and the, um, the solitons. Um, at the moment, we, we cannot guarantee that we are looking at, um, I mean, we can guarantee that the, the, at the study region, these are probably, most probably, internal solitons. But in other regions, a, a signal from small eddies, sub-mesoscale eddies, etc may contaminate and may be an interesting thing to look at per se, including fronts, not only the eddies, but the fronts, which will produce, in some occasions, very similar fe uh, features uh, as, as the ones I've shown. All right. Thanks again. Okay. And, uh, let's have our next week.